Welcome to the Financial Toolkit for Lawyers. My name is Professor Seth C. Orenberg, and I'll be your instructor in this course. We're going to learn how to become better consumers of financial information. While this short course won't make you a certified accountant, it'll make it easier for you to understand the statements and documents accountants produce and make you more able to help your clients make business decisions based on financial information. Along the way, I'm sure you'll pick up some tips and tricks which will help you in managing your own law practice. We're going to cover four lessons. First, we're going to introduce financial accounting and cover some basics. Then we're going to discuss the accounting process in some more detail and build some of the key financial statements. Third, we're going to discuss equity financing. And fourth, we're going to discuss financial statement analysis or ratio analysis and learn how to work with financial statements to render business decisions. So let's get started. What are we going to cover in this lecture? Well, first we're going to define what is accounting. Uh, what are we doing here today? What are we, what are we learning about? And define that scope. We're going to briefly go over business organizations, which is a course, obviously, you know, I teach. Many of you are in my course on business organizations and corporations. But we're going to look at it from an accounting standpoint. We're going to talk about GAAP, Generally Accepted Accounting Principles, which is a U.S. standard for accounting. We're going to very briefly touch on the core financial statements, uh, how to identify them. And as you worked on, we're going to talk a little about how they're prepared. The goal of this course is to make you a consumer, not a producer of financial statements. But by going through some simple exercises in preparation, you really do learn a lot. And we'll get to some analysis. We're going to analyze some transactions using the accounting equations. And that's going to help us get some tools in our toolkit that we're going to then take with us into later lessons today when we start doing some group work and some practical applications uh, as far as what lawyers would have to be able to do. Accounting is actually a pretty general concept. I mean, we talk about accounting in a real casual sense, and it really just means identifying uh, activities and keeping records of them. So you can account for your calories. You can account for your reps in the gym. Uh, you can account for uh, people's birthdays. You know, we use that term really generally. We're going to focus, though, and we're going to use that term really specifically here uh, to talk about financial accounting, which is about reporting economic activity to external users. So um, instead of tracking ourselves, we're going to try to use this as a reporting out. So who does accounting, uh, financial accounting? Who does financial accounting? Well, business organizations, both for-profit and non-profit business organizations, both need to account for their, their money, their records, and how they're performing. Although they're measured differently, you know, you wouldn't measure the success of a school like Duquesne University in the same way you'd measure the success of, I don't know, Google or Netflix. Uh, in both cases, you need to consider what you're taking in, what you're putting out. In, in the case of the university, you know, we, we have to make sure that we are uh, accounting uh, so that we have enough money coming in that we can afford our expenses over that given year, right? Even though it's a nonprofit. And of course, a business organization is going to be looking at profits. And those profits are important because they may encourage others to further invest in that company. All right, let's talk about three kinds of business organizations. This should be, hopefully, a review for most of you, and it is a simplified version of what I cover in class. First, we've got a proprietorship or a sole proprietorship, more technically, but a sole proprietorship. A proprietorship is defined in accounting as a business that is owned by one person. And it's not a separate legal entity from that person. That person's going to report the income from that business on their personal tax returns. They're going to account for that business as part of their personal income. Uh, that person may, in fact, have one bank account that they use for personal and business purposes, although we're going to talk a little bit about why even with one bank account, we can have separate accounts. We can account for things, and you should. You, sh you might use a spreadsheet program like Excel or Quicken, uh, QuickBooks, in order to keep track of what's different between your business and personal life, or you can use a separate bank account. Now, the, the upside of a proprietorship is they are super simple. You just start doing business, and that's it. You don't usually have to file 
anything with the state to create that entity. Although, again, probably aside from this course, you should know you would have to file uh, if you were to have employees. You, there's all sorts of, you know, if, if, you, if you operate a liquor store, you need a license. You know, there's other registrations, even if it's a sole proprietorship. So just in terms of the business itself, really simple. But what's the problem? The problem is that there's unlimited liability to the owner. So you have your little pizza shop and uh, everything's going well until an employee burns their hand on the oven. And uh, that employee can then sue you, the owner, the sole proprietor, in your personal capacity. And that means your house uh, is, is at stake in that litigation, etc. There are some businesses where this is appropriate, but uh, usually they're small. Usually they're small. Otherwise, we would really care. A business that creates a lot of liabilities, we would want to protect the owner from those liabilities, the liabilities that the business causes. So that's a sole proprietorship, our simplest organizational form. Next, we have a partnership. A partnership is two or more individuals who carry on as co-owners of business for profit. Two or more individuals who carry on as co-owners of business for profit. And once again, we have a similar situation as the sole proprietor uh, in that this is not a separate entity. It's, it's going to be filed on their personal tax returns. And we have unlimited liability of the owners, uh, just like we did with a sole proprietorship. But this is actually even worse because partners have what's called joint and several liability. So any one of, let's say there are three owners, let's say there are three owners in our partnership, any one of those owners is totally liable for all of that partnership's uh, debts, torts, crimes, etc., um, so now you're not only at risk for business uh, harms that you yourself caused as a sole proprietor, but now you're also subject to the risk that one of your partners does something naughty, and you, uh, the wealthiest partner, usually is the one you'll go after in a litigation, gets left holding the bag. And then we get to the corporation. A corporation is a business owned by, well, could be by one person or by one entity or by millions of people, uh, whether it's what we call closely held or, or, or publicly owned. And the concept is that shares are the percentage of ownership of a company. So a company could have 100 shares. If you have one, you own 1%. A company has a million shares. You own 1,000. You have uh, 1%, if I did the math right. And uh, this is ownership in what? In a separate legal entity. The corporation, unlike the partnership, unlike the sole proprietorship, the corporation distinguishes itself from those other forms because the corporation is a legal entity. It gets its own tax number, kind of looks like a social security number. It's formatted a little differently, but has the same number of digits as a human social, and in fact files its own tax return. And in return for going through this hassle, the owners, now they enjoy limited liability. The corporation is its own person, if you will. It's its own entity. It's a better way to put it. The corporation is its own entity. And so corporate debts, corporate torts, to corporate crimes, those stay in the corporation. Well, there is exceptions. It's called piercing the corporate veil and yada, yada, yada. But for today, right, separate in your mind, big, broad categories the partnership style, which is what we call a flow-through, where the liabilities, the um, income, the losses all flow through to the owners. There's no legal separation. There's no separate status for that partnership thing or that sole proprietorship thing. On the other hand, on the other hand, the corporation, the corporate form, which does separate the entity of the corporation from its owners and creates a taxable entity at a level above the shareholders so it gets taxed first has to file its tax return and also provides a liability shield for the owners some details uh, shareholders own a corporation by the number of shares they have or percentage of shares they have so like i mentioned just a second ago if you have uh, one out of 100 shares you have one percent uh, if you have 10 out of 1,000 shares, you still have 1%. Uh, but a shareholder could have many shares. shareholder could have all the shares, right? There's all different ways that those are structured. 
And in fact, there are different types of shares. Uh, there's there are shares that have preferences. Um, we call that preferred stock because it has preferences. We'll talk about that in venture capital finance uh, because venture capital investors like to buy preferred shares, get their preference. We have publicly traded shares. That's like on the NASDAQ, the New York Stock Exchange, companies that you've probably heard of, Microsoft, Google. There are privately held companies, also some of which you've probably heard of, uh, companies that are going public. So a lot there. And uh, uh, the key thing, though, is that we're, we're going to be looking at a very, a very standardized, hierarchical structure. All right. And, and let me show you that structure on the next slide. So here's a corporate structure, and uh, basically you want to think of it as uh, the shareholders are the ultimate owners, and it's their property. The corporation is kind of like their property, uh, and, and they have a percentage of that property based on how many shares they have, what percentage of shares they, they have, and they are the owners. They don't do very much aside from own the shares. They're, they're passive. They're not going to manage the company on a day-to-day -day basis. Instead, they, uh, each one of those shares comes with a voting right. So if you have one share, one vote, two shares, two votes. And what do you vote for? Primarily the board of directors. The board of directors is a group of professional managers whose job is to run the corporation. And they're vested with the authority to do all the day-to-day -day corporate things, including, uh, well, not just day-to-day, -day, but also extraordinary things, such as appointing our executives. And we're going to be playing roles of some of these executives in this class, which hopefully will be a neat experience for many of you. But uh, a couple names, as you probably know, president, vice president, um, and corporation structure, all different sorts of ways. Sometimes it's the president, sometimes the uh, CEO, the chief executive officer. But uh, keep the structure in mind because... The officers uh, are appointed by the board. The board's elected by the shareholders. The shareholders own the corporation. And this hierarchical structure is standard to corporations and is very much distinguishable and distinct from a partnership where you, you generally have a flat structure. And here we have a hierarchy. Now let's shift gears just a little bit. That was corporate business entity law. Now we're going to talk about accounting and then smush the concepts together. So there is a concept called GAAP or a, uh, or a really a standard set called GAAP. There are different standards for different um, jurisdictions. And so in America, we have GAAP. In Canada, there's IFRS. Uh, there are other standards in other jurisdictions, but we are going to focus on GAAP here in uh, our American law class. Whatever jurisdiction you're in, whatever accounting system you're reporting to, again, in the U.S., it's GAAP. So that's G-A-A-P. What, that's what you'll be uh, hopefully being most exposed to. But whatever the system is, there are really some characteristics or principles uh, underlying why these rules exist. Um, so what are we reporting on and why are we reporting on it? Well, one, we are looking at financial information that is relevant. If it's not going to make a difference then there's no point in reporting it. This is about external reporting. It's about taking action based on information. So if the information is not relevant, it's not necessary to report it. We're going to look for actionable, relevant information. Uh, two, it needs to be faithful, complete, neutral, and free from error. Uh, we're going to see that actually neutrality is, is hard, um, even as something that seems like this is just math, right? But, it, but it's not. There's some art and science involved, but that's the goal. We're trying to faithfully represent reality through accounting statements. Uh, the third virtue of a good accounting system is its comparability, that we can use accounting standards. Since everyone is reporting on the same standard, we can compare apples to apples, so, you know, if, if we see the net revenue of Apple and the net revenue of Microsoft, we can actually compare those numbers because they are used, uh, they are created using similar principles, using similar standards. Uh, verifiability, that the reports that are generated by accountants come from data such that if we ran the same calculations on the data, we'd get the same results. So it's, it's testable and verifiable. It's, it's somewhat scientific. 
in that regard. Now, what may be less scientific, as we'll see, is what calculations we run and how we make certain choices. But this is based on data. This is not based on imagination, but this is based on some fundamental basis in math and numbers. Five, timeliness relates to relevance. The reports need to be available in time to make useful difference uh, to decision makers if they're late or if they have to do with things that were years ago, not very useful and quite frankly, not very relevant. So relevance and timeliness go together and understandability. Uh, accountants know or should know that the people who read these things and work with these things are like lawyers like us some of the time. So let's, uh, let's make sure the information is comprehensible to lawyers and other decision makers who are going to be using these reports. Let's go one level less abstract and let's think about how those characteristics flow into some more specific principles. There are nine principles that you should be aware of when it comes to how accounting records are generated. One, every separate entity maintains its own record. So as I mentioned in the beginning, a person might use one bank account for various ventures they're involved in, but they still need to keep separate records, separate accounts, separate financial accounts in each entity. And in fact, in a complicated business, you would probably have separate accounting for different departments. So the legal department would have its own accounting records and the technology department, etc. Two, consistency. Use the same accounting policies and procedures from period to period. And this is a more specific version of uh, uh, comparability, which was a more general characteristic. So in addition to being able to compare one firm to another firm, what we might call a horizontal comparison, we might also want to have a longitudinal uh, comparison between a firm at time A and a firm at time B. Three, cost. Each economic transaction is back based on actual original cost. And so save your receipts, people. That's why your accountant wants to see your receipts. Uh, that is a uh, verifiable source of data. So uh, basing things on cost has to do with verifiability. Full disclosure, right, that goes to faithful representation. The counting information has to be sufficient to make knowledgeable decisions. And so that means we have to trust that the data we're seeing is representative of everything that's out there. And we're not hiding information to try to make uh, the balance sheet look better. We're going to assume that the business will continue in the future. So we're going to operate the business as a going concern. Of course, when that's not true, uh, we're not going to use that assumption. For example, if a business is going into bankruptcy, the accounting rules change, but we're not going to worry about that here. We're going to continue on with our accounting principles. And number six is matching that financial transactions are reported in the period that they were realized. We're going to need to come back to that term and when are transactions realized. Um, there's a difference between cash accounting and accrual accounting. We're going to talk about that a little later. But the idea here for now is that we want to have a consistent system. We want to uh, be consistent in how we match transactions to time. All right, seven, materiality. In other words, relevance, right? Going to the relevance uh, principle. And we, uh, we want the items that are significant enough to be uh, presented because the key thing is making decisions based on financial information. So what information is necessary to make decisions if it's material? Um, monetary units, we're going to express things in dollars. Okay, um, you might think, well, we could express it in pesos or bitcoins or something else. And that's true. Uh, if you were in Mexico, you probably would express things in pesos. But Bitcoin might not be the best way to express things since its value changes so frequently, it's not particularly stable. Anyway, we're going to use dollars. So just take that as a given. And last recognition that revenues are recorded when earned and expenses are recorded when incurred. Again, we have to talk more about what does earned mean, what does incurred mean, but we're going to use the same rules all the time so that our reports are comparable, not just between our business unit or business entity over time, but between different units or different entities.
Let's now take a minute and look at some of the fundamental documents and concepts that are just so core to accounting that we just we just need to take a minute to, to look at them together. So first, the income statement. So what is an income statement? It is going to be a report of revenues and expenses during a given period of time. Could be monthly, could be annual, could be over 10 years, could be over a day. The point is that we have a period of time over which during that time we got some money and we spent some money, right? And so the overall amount, right, how much I received minus how much I paid equals my net income. Take a look at the example here. We've got a uh, car repair company. So their business is to get in money from revenues. But of course, you pay expenses, rent, salary, supplies, fuel. And so pretty straightforward. On the one hand, you've got your credits. That's what you are bringing in, your, your positive cash, your revenues called credits. That's in one column. In the other column, you have your debits, your expenses, how much things cost you. Uh, credits minus debits equals your net income in this case. Remember that partnerships and corporations function in critically different ways, especially when it comes to accounting and law. A corporation, under a matter as a matter of law, is a separate entity and offers limited liability to owners. A partnership uh, is is not going to offer that unlimited liability, depending on your your jurisdiction, may not even be considered a separate entity. And we have some different concepts that apply to partners versus shareholders as well. So the statement of changes in equity has to do with what we call partners equity. And so this is a partnership concept. And uh, the idea here is we, we need to account for the amounts that each partner sort of uh, is entitled to as a result of their participation in the business. Up next, we have the balance sheet. And this is maybe the most prototypical uh, and, and, and potentially most important of the accounting statements for you to know. The balance sheet is going to report your assets, liability, and shareholders' equity. So those are those are the three concepts. Everything in a business can fit into one of those categories. You have assets, which can generally be understood as um, either a money that you're owed or, or valuable property that has some type of some type of worth. So that's a a positive number. Uh, on the other side of that ledger, on the other side of that balance sheet, if you will, are going to be your liabilities. Those are monies that you owe. And then the uh, the distinction between the two, whether it's positive or negative, would be how much equity is remaining in the business. So if you have more assets than liabilities, uh, that is going to be shown as having a positive amount of shareholder equity. And the idea there being that there's, uh, if you want to think of it this way, equity is the amount of value in that business. So uh, the, the balance sheet equation... Let's put that on the board here. The balance sheet equation, which is also called the fundamental equation. It's, it's the accounting equation. It's the most important equation uh, in accounting. It's actually very simple. is assets equals liabilities uh, plus equity. And so, it, you know, as you might remember from algebra, uh, we, can, uh, we can swap these orders around. For example, by subtracting liabilities from both times, assets minus liabilities equals equity. And so, again, what we see is equity is the value remaining when we take all of our positives, uh, subtract all of our negatives, and what's left is the equity, which is a sort of way of understanding the value of a business. Uh, more equity means that, the, that the, uh, if the equity is positive, the business has more assets than liabilities. If the equity was, is negative, uh, it has more liabilities than assets. All right, next up is the statement of cash flows, another one of our financial statements. Have you ever heard the expression, cash is king? Right, what's the big deal about cash? Well, it's a problem when you need it and don't have it. Like, have you ever had trouble paying rent? Have you ever been unable to pay the balance on your credit card? Right, bad things happen, or at least uh, costly things happen, when you don't have enough cash. And so we don't just think of a business in terms of how much equity it has overall, but we want to make sure we, we have enough positive cash flow to meet our ongoing obligations. So the statement of cash flows is a very important document because it shows whether the business is 
likely or unlikely to be able to meet its obligations on an ongoing basis. Let's take a look at how these financial statements link together because they're not, they're not to be understood in a vacuum, but rather they all come from the same fundamental data, the transaction data. So to start, uh, let's start with our income statement. Our income statement is going to be built based on uh, how much we earned and how much we spent in a given period. And so over this period, uh, we spent uh, this month $7,800 in expenses, had $10,000 in revenue. That totaled $2,200 net income. That's simply revenue minus expenses. So we're going to bring that down uh, because as we will see in a minute when we do our transaction analysis, uh, that income will be in the form of cash. And we're going to balance that cash, uh, which is a asset. Uh, we're going to we're going to have that credit in the asset column. We have to credit something on the other side. We're going to credit retained earnings because that's what that cash is. It's additional earnings uh, that is now increased the value of, of the business. In this particular period, the, uh, the retained earnings was increased by 2200 uh, to offset the increase in cash, and the owners decided to take out $200 in dividend payments to themselves. So we're going to deduct that for a final balance of 2000 on our retained earnings. We had 10000 before. We add that to what happened this month, and 10000 and 2000 is 12000 And we're going to bring that over to our balance sheet because we're going to have to balance it, and we're going to see that our total equity uh, is going to then arrive at 12000 And we see how that retained earnings above it is, is 2000 That was the 2200 of new cash that came in, which was balanced by an increase in uh, retained earnings, and then retained earnings were paid out, reducing them. And so that's going to net us to uh, the 2000 in retained earnings. Meanwhile, we, as I mentioned, also increased our cash position. And so that is going to impact our balance sheet. We're going to have a higher amount uh, by, by the $2,200 uh, minus the $200 that was actually paid uh, because when we received our income, we put it into our bank account, that increased our cash account. Uh, when we paid the dividend, that decreased our cash account. So that is going to be factored into the balance sheet as well as to the statement of cash flows, which tells you how the money moved around. And we see there that it was a net increase of $3,700 in cash. And again, all this is coming from the same underlying data, the same underlying transaction. So next, we're going to focus on analyzing and getting those transactions recorded properly. In addition to the financial statements themselves, the accountants will often make notes on them, which are going to show additional detail and can be helpful in doing analysis. By the way, where does money come from anyway? You know, it doesn't grow on trees, right? At least that's what they say. Uh, there's a couple ways that businesses make money. Um, one of the areas that I work in is venture capital finance. That means going out and selling stock to investors, issuing share capital to investors. You can also go to a bank and get money from a bank, right? You can get money from a credit card, right? And that's acquiring debt from creditors. And in addition, what we saw in the example just given was that the business can generate its own cash from profits, right? If it doesn't distribute the profits or spend them, those profits stay in the bank as cash, uh, also known as, as retained earnings. And those retained earnings can be used to finance the business later. And so, uh, you know, various things you can do if the company starts running out of money, you can either cut costs, right? Reduce how much you're spending every month. Uh, although that can be harmful because sometimes you need to spend money to make money. Uh, you could increase how much you make every month, maybe through marketing, but sometimes, again, you have to spend money to make money. Uh, you could uh, issue uh, new stock, and you could sell new stock and, and get new investors, and that would increase how much cash you have. You will uh, then be issuing equity and receiving cash, and those numbers will balance. Or you could be acquiring debt, which is a liability. And so you would book the debt on one column and book the assets, the cash from the debt, on the other column. And again, those would balance. And so we see that uh, the different financing sources are all going to play into our uh, fundamental financial documents. Let's take a look at a transaction and start to get a little bit more practical now that we've spent just under a half hour uh, going over some fundamental definitional concepts. So if you've just been, you know, listening passively with your, your camera off for a minute, maybe, you know, just absorbing some of that, tune back in. <laughs> 
Okay, tune back in, get out a pencil. Uh, let's go through this together and uh, let's actually go ahead and analyze a transaction. And we're gonna use a standard uh, process to go ahead and do this transaction analysis, all right? So again, we're gonna get a little bit more practical here. So uh, tune back in, grab a pencil, and uh, feel free to follow along at home. There are three steps we're gonna follow for every transaction, every occurrence that happens. One, we need to determine which accounts are affected. Second, we determine if this is going to be an increase or a decrease, a debit or a credit. And three, we record the entry properly. So let's try it out. There are a number of standard accounts which we're going to maintain. So we're gonna have a cash account, right? And that could be coins, currency, banks, petty cash, but you, you get it, cash, right? Green dollar bills. Accounts receivable, money we haven't got yet that we're owed, right? We go and do a job for a customer, I'll pay you on Tuesday for hamburger today. Well, then that becomes accounts receivable. We don't actually have greenbacks yet. We have a promise to pay. Prepaid expenses. Sometimes we can spend cash now and are owed something in the future. And so, uh, for example, you might um, have a, a one-year agreement where fuel will be delivered every Friday for a year. Uh, you might pay for that up front, right? Uh, you know, I, I know that works with my lawn care service. You know, I pay on January 1st for lawn care for the year, and uh, I am to be receiving services for a period of time. Those are prepaid expenses. And then uh, another common category, property, plants, and equipment. These are assets that provide benefits uh, for a long term. Uh, these are also sometimes called long-term assets. And so, uh, you know, the building that we're in, uh, the equipment that we have. So, again, the first step is to determine which uh, account is affected by a transaction. So these are some of the accounts which are going to be affected by various types of transactions. These are all asset accounts, uh, but just like the balance sheet has to balance, every time an asset account is affected, we're also going to have an equal and opposite effect on either the liabilities or the equities account because assets equals liabilities plus equities. So let's look at what are some liabilities accounts. Well, uh, debts, a bank loan, that's a liability. You have an obligation an obligation to repay cash in the future to the bank. Accounts payable, the inverse of accounts receivable. Someone did work for you, you haven't paid them yet. You have an obligation to repay for supplies and services uh, that were rendered onto you. And so you, you have a promise to pay someone else. That's an account payable, that's a liability. And unearned revenue is uh, when you have done, uh, when you have received cash for work you have not done yet. So uh, when I, the homeowner, uh, pay $100 at the beginning of the year for uh, lawn care services for the year. Uh, I now, as the homeowner, I now have a prepaid expense, which is an asset. But on the other side of the fence, the lawn care company, now they have unearned revenue. They have cash that came in, but they haven't done the service yet. They actually owe services. So accounts payable are uh, monies that are owed and unearned revenue is services or goods that are owed. Bank loans again, cash that's owed. So liabilities, all things that are owed. And then last but not least uh, by any means uh, is our equity accounts, which might also be affected by a transaction. In fact, there is often going to be a opposite and equal reaction in equities as we impact assets or liabilities because uh, assets always equals liabilities plus equities. That's the fundamental equation. So what are our equity accounts? These are the net assets that are owned not by the entity, not by the corporation, but by its owners, its shareholders. What is the value of the shareholders? And how much has their investment grown? Uh, how much uh, are they owed effectively by the corporation for their investment in it? So we have the common stock, that's the amount that they put in, and the retained earnings, which is going to be the, the sum of the income and losses over the business, which could, 
theoretically be distributed as dividends. Dividends are payments by the corporation to its owners, uh, usually in the form of payment to shareholders. And these retained earnings uh, can be used to pay those dividends. And so effectively, it's almost like a bank account, an equity account, uh, where the corporation has money that will eventually flow to its owners. And that brings us back to, I can't say it enough, the fundamental equation, right? Assets equals liabilities plus equities. Assets equals liabilities plus equity. And uh, what this means is that we're going to use what's called a double entry accounting method because every transaction gets recorded twice because it's going to impact at least two things, right? Anything that impacts assets has to, has to impact liabilities and or equities or it won't balance, right? We have an equation that has to balance after every transaction is entered. So if we're going to have a uh, transaction recorded in assets, we're going to need to find a place for that on the other side of the equation too. If assets goes up, either liabilities or equities has to go up as well to keep the equation balanced. And again, every equation, every time. We don't do this at the end, but rather double entry means each transaction is recorded twice. As we go through the next 10 transactions, I really do recommend that you try to log them on your own. At the end of all this, I'll show you a version of this chart all filled in. And if you'd like, you can get a copy of this chart online. Uh, follow that link and, and you can actually work with this on uh, Google Sheets which might be a nice way for you to fill this in as we go along with this exercise. Let's perform some transaction analysis, starting with transaction number one. A uh, good place to start, right? And we're gonna have 10 of these transactions. So uh, let's start with number one, and here we have an issuance of shares to the owner. This is actually very commonly the first thing a company will do upon starting up, it will sell shares to its owners and founders in order to raise its initial capital. And how are we gonna book this? Well, uh, the company is, is getting cash. Cash is an asset. It's one of the common asset accounts. So we're going to increase the amount of cash and thereby increasing our amount of assets. And that has to balance. So how are we going to balance that? Well, we haven't incurred any liabilities because importantly, uh, you don't have to pay your shareholders back. It, it's not like a loan. A loan's an obligation to repay money in the future. It must be paid. A loan is a liability. But here we haven't actually loaned money to the company. We've bought stock in it. So that's actually an equity. It's going to increase the amount of equities because the shareholders have put value into the company. The company now has $10,000 more value. And so the equation balances because we've increased assets by 10,000. We've increased equity by 10,000. Assets equals liability plus equity. Assets, 10,000 equals liabilities, zero plus equity, 10,000. The account balances, awesome. Let's look at transaction number two. In this transaction, the business is raising money by borrowing from a bank. They are taking out a loan. They are incurring a debt. A debt is a liability because it is an obligation to repay money in the future. And liabilities are obligations to repay money or provide goods or services in the future. So we're going to book the bank loan for its value of $3,000 to increase our liabilities. We have more liabilities. We have more obligations because of this loan. But it also resulted in us having cash on hand. And now the business has cash in its bank account, which it can use for other purposes. And cash is an asset. So we're going to increase our cash account, which is an asset account and we increase it by the same amount of the loan. So we have a $3,000 increase to assets in the account of cash and a $3,000 increase to liabilities in the account of bank loan. And 3,000 equals 3,000. It balances, awesome. Let's look at transaction three. Transaction three 
is illustrating an important point that we can have an effect on just one side of the accounting equation so long as, again, we still get balance at the end. And that's because within one of these categories of assets, liabilities, and equity, there are accounts. So we might both increase and decrease an asset account, for example, as we have done here. So what have we done here? We have bought equipment and we have spent cash. Equipment is an asset because it is a valuable thing that can be used in the future. Cash is also an asset. It's valuable, can be used in the future. They go in the same category. We have spent one to receive the other. So we are going to decrease the cash in the amount we spent, 3000 and increase uh, equipment, the thing we bought, for the amount we originally paid for it, which is going to be equal to the amount of cash. It's the amount we originally paid for it. So we're going to decrease cash by 3000 increase equipment by 3000 which is a net of zero. And that means that liabilities and equity should be zero, which is exactly what we see here. Our account balances, awesome. Let's try one more and just complicate things just a little bit, just a little bit. We're going to use two accounts to pay for a tow truck. How do we book it? How do we book this transaction? One transaction, bought a truck. How do we book it? So where do we get the money from? Well, the, the tow truck's 8,000 and the tow truck is what? Equipment. What is, where does equipment go? Equipment is a type of asset. So it goes in our assets column and we now have a, an $8,000 truck. So we're going to add $8,000 to assets, meaning we have to then find the, the other, uh, the balance for this. So how did we pay for the truck? 3000 came for our cash account, similar to last time. So we deduct from cash, but where did the other 5,000 come from? The other 5,000 in this case came from a bank loan. So in this equation, we're going to then add 5,000 to our liabilities under the account bank loan. And guess what? It balances, right? Because $8,000, the value of the truck, minus 3,000, the cash we paid, minus 5,000, the liabilities we incurred equals zero. Our balance sheet balances. Awesome. All right, transaction number five, as we are doing transaction analysis and double entry accounting, hopefully starting to feel a little familiar, right? Just make sure the numbers balance and put them in the right account. So let's take another transaction. We're going to pay for our year of insurance coverage. Many people do this. I know that for my homeowners, I get a little discount if I pay in the beginning of the year as opposed to every month. So nice practice. Uh, so what are we going to get? We're going to get insurance. And that insurance is a service that's going to be rendered to us in the future. And so we now have an asset. We now have a valuable thing. We have insurance coverage. And, uh, and that's going to be calculated, uh, or that's going to be tabulated, I should say, under uh, the category prepaid expenses. Right? It's a prepaid expense. Insurance is an expense we have to take on. We've paid for it at the beginning of the year. We'll get it through the rest of the year. Now, in this example, I broke it out a little more specifically. Maybe we want a column for prepaid insurance. Why would we do that? Well, it's a little more specific, right? And if we have a lot of different types of insurance or if we have a lot of different prepaid expenses, getting a little more granular can help. But we could calculate this as prepaid expenses. The point is it's an asset, right? It's an asset. It's something valuable that we now have. Well, how did we get it? We paid cash. So we deduct the cash. That's an asset. We increase the prepaid expenses, or if you want a separate category, prepaid insurance. And as a result, we're going to uh, going to balance our, our balance sheet that way. Let's try another one. Number six, corporation pays 2000 to the bank to reduce the amount of a loan. Well, bank loans are what? A liability. And we're going to reduce a liability. So we're going to, we're going to debit, we're going to deduct how much is in our liabilities column by 2000 the amount we paid. Where did the money come from? Cash. We have 2000 less cash. Negative 2000 equals negative 2000 and we're balanced. We're good to go. <laughs> Let's try one more. I just want you to see that, you know, it, once you get the hang of it, it's not so scary, right? It's, it's actually just, number one, determine which accounts are affected. 
uh, in a big way, in a little way. The most important thing, absolutely, is, is getting in the right big column. Asset. Is this an asset? Is this a liability? Is this equity? Okay? That is critical or things won't balance. But beyond that, we also want to determine which accounts within that. So that's going to help us do analysis later if we're, if we're careful. We already saw that there's some flexibility in how we define these accounts. But, you know, in our asset account, we're always going to have cash. And um, what happens if the corporation receives $400 as advanced payment from a customer for services to be performed uh, in the future? Now, this gets a little bit more tricky, and we're not going to dwell on it because this is for really for the accountants. But, but let's just talk about that real quick because this does happen that we might uh, receive money now and have an ongoing liability over time in the future. How do we book that? Well, the, the fact that we got cash is easy. What do we do? How, what, what account does that impact when we receive cash? It's an asset. It's an asset, right? And so we've just increased our assets. Our cash accounts in particular uh, under assets will go up by the $400 we received. And that means we have to find something else on the uh, either, you know, either we have to deduct an asset from somewhere uh, which that's not the case. We didn't like sell a truck or something. Instead, uh, we now have an obligation. An obligation in accounting terms is called a liability. And we have to perform $400 worth of work uh, in the near future. In particular, this is a liability categorized as unearned revenue, right? because we didn't do the work. We didn't earn it. We received revenue, but we didn't do the work. So we're going to book that as a liability. All right, let's try one more. Number eight, transaction eight, uh, involve automobile repairs of $10,000 for a customer who paid us $8,000 uh, in cash and an IOU, a promise to pay us another $2,000 in the future for a total of ten. dollars now, you might be thinking, geez, we just got money. It didn't cost us anything. How am I going to balance this? Well, this is where the equity column comes in because by the sweat of your brow, by the efforts of your labor, yeah, you've made money, right? And where does that show up? It shows up in the equities. Let's see how that breaks down. So again, a little bit of a wrinkle here. It was paid 8000 up front, 2 in an IOU. Let's put those in the right accounts. What's $8,000 in cash, uh, cash account, right? That goes in our asset, cash account. How about the $2,000 owed to us? Money owed to us are accounts receivable. Accounts receivable is defined as amounts owed by customers. So now we've got $10,000 between the two that go to our assets. We haven't incurred any liabilities. We don't owe anyone anything. Rather, what have we done? We've increased the value of the business. And so we're going to add that to our, our retained earnings in our equity column. In this example, again, a little bit more specific for the accountants out there. Maybe it's helpful to categorize that as repair revenue so you remember where that, uh, that retained earnings came from. But the key thing is the business is worth more. You made 10 grand. So equity, our value, shareholder value, goes up. And what goes up can also come down. Shareholder equity doesn't just increase forever, but rather if the company doesn't turn a profit in a, in a given period, that's going to result in a decrease overall in our equity column. So let's take a look at an example of that. This has been a bit simplified in terms of the visual, so I'm going to talk through it a bit. Corporation paid operating expenses for the month as follows. $1,600 for rent, $3,500 for salaries, $2,000 for supplies, and 700 for truck operating expenses uh, on credit. So let's book it, right? Okay, one, the rent. The rent was due. We paid it from our cash, and that cash is gone, right? Where did it, how do we balance that? Well, 1600 is a negative in our assets because we have 1600 less cash. And where did that money come from? It came from our company value. The company is now less valuable. That money's just gone. So we reduce retained earnings. The shareholders have a, don't have a claim on that money anymore. It's gone. So we're going to balance the rent payment with negative 1600 in our assets uh, under cash and negative 1600 in our equities under retained earnings. 
Same thing with salary, exact same story there, uh, because we're going to deduct 3500 from our cash account, from our bank account, and we're going to also deduct 3500 from equity, so it balances that company. We just we paid our employees. That's their money now. It's not ours, right? So their retained earnings goes down. We're going to deduct another 2000 for the expense of our supplies. We paid that in cash. We used them up. They're gone. And so that's just the cost of doing business that came out of the retained earnings. And then finally, we have this expense for a truck. Uh, what happened with the expense for a truck? Well, we didn't actually pay cash. We're going to owe it in the future. What is something we owe in the future? It's a liability. Did that liability go up or down? It went up. We owe more money. We have more liabilities. We have $700 of new obligations. How do we balance that? Well, we didn't get any assets out of it. We didn't deduct any liabilities from it. It must be in our equities once again. And now, over some time, as we pay that back, uh, we're going to lose that value. And so we're going to book that now as a negative 700 in terms of equities. Again, a more complicated example, but once again, you see that over a series of transactions, each transaction balances as we record each entry, and overall the balance sheet will always balance by using the double entry method. All right, one last transaction, folks, and then we'll break from this module uh, and, and do a little bit more group work. All right, appreciate you hanging in for the lecture. But last but not least, let's pay our shareholders and then summarize things about what happened. So 10th transaction, our owner uh, wants some money for his own purposes. So how does that work? Well, he only can actually get money from the business if it actually has cash on hand. So let's say that he wants to pay himself. He's the owner. I mean, he's entitled to that money, provided there's some retained earnings. That money will come from cash. And so he can take out a dividend payment or the company can issue a dividend which is the payment of retained earnings. So we're going to deduct retained earnings, deduct cash. Uh, dividends uh, are going to be a, a minus to our retained earnings because instead of being retained, they're being distributed. So we're going to reduce how much we've retained. Picture a picture a, a dam holding back water. That's a retention or a retention pond, right? And then that some of that water is let out, right? That's our cash, right? So some of our retained earnings are released. The amount of water in our retention pond goes down. The amount of retained earnings in our equity goes down. And how do we balance that? Well, we also lost some cash because we had to pay for it, well, with cash. So we have those accounts balanced as well. And that's how a dividend is booked in a double entry accounting. All right. Now, those were all separate accounts, but we can actually put it all together and get a total that we can see how we uh, spent our money. And, and in fact, we can incorporate this not just into our statement of cash flows, but we can use this to build an income statement and a balance sheet. And that's the challenge assignment for this, uh, this module, right, is to, is, to, is to build those basic documents based on booking these transactions. So remember that we, we were careful to keep all these things in their various accounts. And um, we've expanded those a little bit here, but I gave you the kind of fundamental accounts. And we can see that we have our account categories, the category is the big ones, assets equals liabilities plus equity. And we see the assets in that mustard color, the liabilities in blue, and our equity is in that nice shade of off red. And uh, those are our three main accounts. Within them, we have sub accounts or, or what you might call the accounts themselves, our cash account, accounts receivable, prepaid insurance. Uh, and here we broke out equipment into equipment and truck. Truck could be equipment, but it's such a big expense. We're going to book it separately. Just It's just more clear, makes the document more usable. And if we add up all of the cash transactions that we had during this period of time, right, we get to 3,700. And that's how much we had positive 3,700 cash flow. And if we look at our accounts receivable, we also increased that by 2,000. We paid for our insurance. So now we have prepaid insurance. That's 2,400. We acquired some equipment. That's 3,000. We acquired a truck. That was 8,000. We had some liabilities along the same time. We had some accounts payable. We owe 700 for some, some fuel supplies for the truck. So that goes in our account payable account uh, column. 
we had some unearned uh, revenue, meaning we now owe $400 worth of services that we got cash for, but didn't do the work yet. And we have some debts that we have to pay. Uh, as you can see, there are pluses and minus, right? We, we had a debt, we increased the debt, and then we paid off that debt a bit, leaving us with a net of 6000 And uh, I won't walk you through every single retained earnings step, but a lot of these transactions did obviously impact retained earnings. And so And once we've totaled up all of those transactions on our summary worksheet, uh, we, we got to some totals, and those totals are what are going to go into our balance sheet and our other documents. So remember that after all of our 10 transactions, uh, some were debits, some were credits, our cash was a net of uh, plus 3700 And there you go. Take a look at the balance sheet. Under assets, we have cash, and there's our 3700 Same with accounts receivable, prepaid insurance. All those numbers carry over because we had transactions that occurred over a period of time, and that left us with this um, st uh, situation, the status of having these amounts in those accounts. We then total up the assets, do the same with liabilities, total liabilities, uh, total the, the equities, and, and then add liabilities plus equities to make sure that we balance, and yes, we do. Uh, we have uh, $19,100 in assets, $19,100 in equities. And of course, that information is also carried through in our statement of stockholder equity, where we see that we uh, opened our balance uh, with uh, zero. We issued 10,000 of stock and we record that there, which resulted in a balance of 10,000 in our stock column. We also earned some money, of which some we dividended out. So we have our net income, uh, which we retained minus the 2,000 we paid is 2,000, giving us our total balance of $12,000 in our statement of stockholder equity. And those statements then are, are prepared at the end of, of a period, sometimes a year, uh, sometimes a month, sometimes a quarter. Uh, they could be interim. And uh, that's basically how we use the double entry method to, to account for transactions. And then at the end of a period, we total up those transactions in their accounts and we present them on financial statements and that gives us a way to look back and understand how we got where we are in the business today. As we're getting to the top of our hour together, I want to thank you for sticking with me through this chapter one lecture on financial accounting, setting a great foundation for you to understand financial accounting basics. Uh, to briefly conclude, let me just recap. Financial accounting is the production of reports so that external users can make business decisions. Businesses can be generally structured in two main ways. On the one hand, partnerships, which are not separate entities. They are flow-through entities. They are an aggregate of the people that form them. Or on the other hand, corporations, which are separate entities, which have their own IRS uh, tax status, uh, which uh, block liabilities from impacting the owners and are therefore very important for business. GAAP, or generally accepted accounting principles, are standard principles that govern the production of financial statements. Those key statements are the income statement, the statement of cash flows in the balance sheet. And when we record entries on these statements, we want to keep in mind always the fundamental accounting equation, which is assets equals liabilities plus equity. And that requires a double entry transaction analysis where we follow three steps. We first determine which accounts are affected and will always affect more than one account, usually two accounts, one which will go up uh, and one which will go down or ones that are on the other side of the balance sheet and both go up or down together. We determine if the account would increase or decrease. We make sure that the net of these effects are zero. In other words, that it's balanced and we record the entry. All right, with that, thank you again for your time and attention. And I'm looking forward to speaking with you again when you're ready for the next chapter.